from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Bitcoin forms a death cross as the crypto sell-off shows no signs of reprieve. We'll explain the technicalities and what they might foreshadow amid renewed crackdowns from China. We'll have the very latest. Plus, an exclusive interview with Okta CEO Todd McKinnon. We'll talk about Okta's mega acquisition of Auth0, big tech antitrust in the enterprise, and the future of vaccine passports as the deadly Delta variant takes off, and why some employers fully embrace remote work, and why some companies just do not. We'll discuss the fate of remote work in a mostly vaccinated U.S. as part of our special series, Work Shifting. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first, Bitcoin falling to a two-week low due to Chinese regulators cracking down on crypto activity. The government has ordered payment platform Alipay and domestic banks to not provide services linked to trading of virtual currencies. The institutions were also ordered to cut off payment channels for crypto exchanges and over-the-counter platforms. The People's Bank of China saying all of this in a statement. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Joe Weisenthal, host of What You Miss, and our very own Ed Ludlow to discuss. Joe, I want to start with you. What exactly does this China crackdown mean? Is it as bad as it sounds? No, I mean, look, it's kind of weird because this is... It, China's like cracking down on crypto every few months, it seems like. Literally every month, it's like, oh, China's about to ban Bitcoin. China's about to crack down. There is, you know, one thing that we knew was coming for a while, which is the sort of purging of a lot of miners, and that hash power seems to have come offline. That's been expected for a while. That will likely move somewhere else, shouldn't have a big effect. As for the crackdown on some trading, you know, there was a Bloomberg story in 2013 saying the same thing. According to our reporting, what, what happened now is more they had a call, uh, the regulators had a call with some of the banks and said, we mean this seriously. So I guess there was some behavior that they didn't like going on. But, uh, you know, I feel like we're going to be living with uh, China's cracking down on crypto headlines for like the rest of our lives. Ed, Bitcoin has officially formed a death cross. Uh, you're going to explain mm. some of the technicals there and what exactly that means. But does that hint at more pain to come? Yes, yeah, so significant losses on Monday. This is where the 50-day moving average falls below the 200-day moving average. Normally, for a security, uh, this is a pretty bearish signal. You see it on the right-hand side of your screen where the pink line falls below the yellow or golden line. But Bitcoin is not a typical security. All we can do is look to past precedent. You know, we did get this death cross in March 2020, but it was no impediment to further gains. We saw shares go up after that point. Back in November 2019, another death cross. That one month later, Bitcoin was significantly lower. So chartists are trying to work out what this all means. The other thing that we're pointing to a lot at the moment is this more narrow trading range. Bitcoin struggling to push above 40,000 US dollars and, and kind of teetering towards 30,000 US dollars. The next phase of the concern is what happens if we breach 30,000? Will there be support there or will Bitcoin see dramatic falls? All right, uh, Joe, we're still waiting, of course, also for the big decision from the SEC on Bitcoin ETFs. Yeah. You've been talking with policymakers. You just had a conversation with Elizabeth Warren. I, I mean, is the fact that there is a delay here, does that signal uh, perhaps that the U.S. could take a, a more difficult stance on crypto to come? You know, it always seems like the hope, uh, the dream, uh, it's always like right around the corner and the cr industry keeps getting disappointed. It seems like it's uh, not, I don't know, like I don't have any special inside information, but it does seem like no one is in a real big hurry in D.C. to get it done. You know that it's clear there are a lot of concerns about crypto for all kinds of reasons. There are concerns about the regulations of the exchanges themselves. There are the concerns about their transparency. Of course, the all the recent headlines about, say, ransomware and so forth, they don't help uh, 
either. So, you know, I just don't think anyone in D.C., the SEC, feels like some big rush to create a new avenue for trading and liquidity in this product. Now, of course, some would argue this is exactly what we need. We need something exchange traded. We need something that someone can buy from their Ameritrade accounts as opposed to having to go somewhere else. So there are certainly arguments on both sides. But uh, right now, you know, every it just keeps like, you know, these series of delays look like a very uh, familiar pattern that the industry has seen for a while. Yeah, Joe, our colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence out with research on Monday saying that the rationale behind the SEC's decision to not approve Bitcoin ETFs is confusing because if you look at other jurisdictions right. outside of the US, Bitcoin ETFs have worked really well. They are a, a cheaper, efficient way for a bigger pool of investors to access or get exposure to Bitcoins. And if you look at the alternatives, some of them are complex, right? You can invest in a stock like MicroStrategy where yeah. they have large holdings of Bitcoin. You can invest in a trust where the securities are all invested against Bitcoin or even, you know, something like going through a crypto platform. But the fees are so high. So basically Bloomberg Intelligence saying they question the rationale of the SEC. Potentially, this could be indicative that a bigger regulatory framework is coming, a bigger U.S. clampdown, and it's not so much about consumer protections. So, uh, Joe, on that note, obviously, yeah. Bitcoin up 13% year to date. It's, it's, you know, not great. Uh, gold is sig significantly lower, but, you know, getting outshined by a lot of other options out there. What, what are the narratives in the communities of fervent, normally fervent believers that you're hearing? I mean, I think there's a lot of things. Look, one of the things that we see in crypto cycles, which is that as Bitcoin rockets higher, suddenly there's like a flood of new coins that everyone in the industry is trying to sell you. Coinbase listing last week a parody coin to Dogecoin about a few weeks after they listed Dogecoin in the first place. It has the effect of sort of blunting the buying power. So the momentum starts to fade because instead of the money going into one coin or two coins, it goes into all the coins. Then there's the lack of inst further institutional adoption. You know, after Tesla and MicroStrategy, I think a lot of people were expecting multiple uh, companies to announce that they were going to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Not really that much. That sort of fizzled out. And look, eventually lines go straight up and some people are sitting on life-changing amounts of money. And they're like, maybe I'll sell a little bit because I want to live, you know, I want to retire early. And then that causes other people to sell. And so there's a lot of reflexivity with all cryptocurrencies, momentum in both directions. So it's very easy for uh, crypto narratives to change. And I just think a few things going one way or the other way, suddenly, uh, you know, look, 13 percent, it's not that bad. It's still pretty good, but it uh, feels very different than it did in March and April. <laughs> So, Ed, I wonder, is Bitcoin losing its reputation as the anti-establishment option? Because, you know, look, there are, as I said, other options out there. Yeah, Joe's pointing out, well, we've talked about China crackdown before, but a China crackdown is what's driving the market on Monday. You know, sometimes an Elon Musk tweet, when we had the colonial pipeline ransomware attack, for example, you know, one of the main takeaways from that story was how easily the FBI were able to use the blockchain technology, the, the ledger, to retrieve some of those ransoms that have been paid in Bitcoin. You know, there's also the discussion around El Salvador making it legal tender. But all of this points to how heavily the involvement of sort of old fashioned central institutions is in the market of Bitcoin right now, as well as all of the retail trade that's going on as well. All right. Lots to watch. And we're going to continue that conversation right now. Meantime, Ed Ledlow, Bloomberg's Joe Weisenthal. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you for jumping in. I want to stick with Bitcoin and the crackdown happening in China and bring, on, bring in Bitcoin mining engineer Brandon Aravanagi, uh, formerly of Gemini. Brandon, look, what's your read on this crackdown in China? Is it, is it really that bad uh, in the long term or could it be something else? Bad? This is fantastic news. I mean, it is a rite of passage for freedom technology to get banned in China. Look at Google. Look at Facebook. In hindsight, were those sell signals for those stocks or were they buy signals? This means that Bitcoin is working, not that it's failing. It's making nations shiver in their boots. And the fact that the market is responding this way, I don't think they fully understand what's going on here. Nations are now picking a side. China is responding to this like they did with Google, like they did with Facebook. That is incredibly bullish for Bitcoin uh, long term and medium term as the ASICs flow out of China and into the United States. Okay, so what do you say to the investors who've bought in, who are shivering in their boots, that their, <laughs> that their investment isn't going to be what they thought it was? Well, those investors are unfortunately not orange-pilled like we are. They're still denominating their returns in U.S. dollars, and to some extent, we all are. But in the long run, 
Bitcoin is going to be where it needs to be. We're going to start valuing our wealth in terms of Bitcoin. And the volatility is the tax that we pay for being on the right side of this trade, this incredible trade in the long run. That's going to be a huge, huge dividend. What is where it needs to be to you? I mean, we've heard to a million, to infinity uh, and beyond. Uh, one Lambo by the end of the year, though, a cheaper Lambo, I guess. I mean, <laughs> what's your price prediction? So I, I don't like to speak too much about price. In my mind, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, and that will always be the case. And the fact that Chinese miners can shut down and go to the United States and somehow this rocks people's perceptions of the long-term trend, which is that Bitcoin is the greatest store of value in the history of planet Earth. Nothing is even comparable. That's just an opportunity. And you know, when I have cash, it goes into Bitcoin because I know uh, what it is. It's the best savings mechanism and blips in hash rate, geopolitical tensions with Bitcoin. These are all bosses along the way to the inevitable state of Bitcoin becoming universally identified as the greatest store of value we've ever seen. So given how much you know about mining, can you explain how are the mining operations in China different from what is happening in the United States? It's a great question. So. In China, a phone call can be made and an entire mining plant can, uh, can, can shut down. And the United States is a little bit more tricky because there's something called federalism. We have things like states' rights. So Texas is becoming the, global, uh, the, the capital of Bitcoin mining in the United States right now. If the federal government tried to do something to Texas to get them to shut down their miners, there'd be lawsuits flowing back and forth. There'd be people with guns on the borders of Texas. Greg Abbott is a big supporter of Bitcoin mining, and federalism is why Bitcoin mining operations getting stronger in Texas, getting stronger in Wyoming, getting stronger in Florida is much safer than under a centrally controlling dominant government like China. And ASIC in the United States is more likely to stay up and mine Bitcoin forever than somewhere else where we don't have this kind of distribution of powers at the federal and state level. Well, speaking about power, are you at all concerned about the position that the U.S. government is going to take on this? We haven't gotten a lot of signals, but we do know that regulation is coming. Thought, yeah, regulation is coming, I think, more towards the exchange side, the people that sell Bitcoin, things of that nature. Uh, but as we see these ASICs flow in from China, when I say ASIC, I mean the Bitcoin mining computer. As we see them flow from China to Texas, Wyoming and Florida, we're going to see more demand for skilled jobs. We're going to see electricians, campus managers, uh, IT staff, booming industries in these states. And what's going to happen? The governors, the local, uh, the local politicians, the mayors, they're going to double down on Bitcoin mining. So suddenly you're going to have strong state incentives to grow the mining industry there. The positives for renewable energy development can't be overstated. Uh, the federal government, you know, they can, they can have their own thoughts on it, but we have states' rights in this country, and that's going to be a big, big boon to Bitcoin in America. If there were bigger mining operations in the United States, how do you think that would impact Bitcoin adoption? Well, uh, clarity from the regulatory side, seeing you know state leaders come out in favor of Bitcoin. You know, if, if it's not just us weirdos on crypto Twitter talking about Bitcoin, but you have governors and mayors talking about it, it would probably give some sense of security to people who are looking to get their you know get their feet wet with Bitcoin. So the more politicians like Cynthia Lummis, Greg Abbott. Uh, Mayor Francis Suarez in Miami, the more of these people we have endorsing Bitcoin, the easier it is for other generations to get involved comfortably and get excited about what we have here. All right. Well, straight from Miami, Florida, uh, Bitcoin mining engineer Brandon Arvanagi, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, we'll be watching, continuing to cover it all. Coming up. The Delta variant is gaining momentum and renewing debate about vaccine passports. We'll have an exclusive interview with Okta co-founder and CEO Todd McKinnon. Where do we even start if we want to do vaccine passports? That conversation is next. This is Bloomberg. Kingdom is pretty highly vaccinated, um, but is also now seeing an increase in infections. And overwhelmingly, these infections are the Delta variant. So this is sort of the next chapter of the COVID pandemic and just reminds us that for every move that humans make, the virus has another one. And we just have to continue to press the case against the pandemic. 
Joshua Sharfstein there, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Vice Dean, talking about the prevalence of the COVID-19 Delta variant in the United Kingdom. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is, of course, supported by Michael Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Now, although the U.S. reports that 150 million Americans have been fully vaccinated, there still remains global concern about the spread of that variant. In Germany, Health Minister Jan Spahn warned of the possibility of a fourth wave, saying it's important to remain cautious as the country plans for a potentially challenging autumn and winter. Joining us now for an exclusive interview, Okta co-founder and CEO Todd McKinnon. So Todd, you come at this from uh, the security perspective. If we were to do this, um, how would we even make vaccine passports happen? But I feel like we have to talk about the politics of it at the start. President Biden has already said there's not going to be a national plan for vaccine passports, but other countries are doing it. Is Biden going the wrong way on this? Thanks for, ha thanks for having me, Emily, on Bloomberg Technology. Okta, as you mentioned, we have over 10,000 customers and we help our customers connect their technology, their apps and services with their customers. So we know a lot about what it takes to get things online and more importantly, what it takes to integrate things that are online together. And with the vaccine, we all know that getting as many people vaccinated as possible is a key to returning to normal and beating this, beating this virus. And we've developed the technology with the amazing breakthroughs to develop the vaccines here in the United States. Now we need to get online with this status of vaccination so we can help businesses and governments, local, uh, local uh, people operating at a local level, help them understand who's, who's vaccinated and who's not so we can safely get back, back to normal. You mentioned the federal level. I understand it. People are in the United States, the previous guest you had on was talking about federalism, which is very important. To, the dividing between the federal rights and the state's rights. We totally agree with that. And we don't think the federal government should go to the extent of creating some central massive vaccine status database, but they could go a long way towards setting the standards, both the, the de facto standards on how things should look and, and what kind of data should be stored to the technical standards on how different groups could come up with a vaccine, online vaccine status system and then that could be trusted by users and it could be trusted by organizations, whether you're going to a basketball game or you're going back to work, something we're very interested in at Okta, getting our employees back into the office when it's appropriate, whether you're anything from local level all, all the way to, to states trying to make sure their, their state employees and their citizens are vaccinated. So I think if we get standardization at the federal level, along with implementation of this technical this technology at the local level, it would be a magical combination. So if we were to do something like this, where would we even start? I mean, it seems like such a massive undertaking, given where we are right now is carrying around these vaccine cards. Where would we start in terms of building this database and how would we make it secure? Well, I, well we're already starting. You're, you're seeing the state of California recently announced that we have a, a, sim a simple online, basically it's an online copy of your, of your paper card. So California is doing it one way, different states are doing it different ways. Uh, different companies and, and different organizations are doing it inconsistently. So I think the federal government could start by saying, here's how it should work. Not storing any information centrally at the federal level, but here's how it should work. Here's the types of information that you need, vaccinated, yes or no, simple name, right? Not a lot of extensive medical history, but if you just standardize what kind of information, what what it looked like, how how what it was appropriate to be used for, and then let people implement to that standard. So then the state of California or your local government or your company could implement an online system that collected that information from a various amount of wherever source they could get it from, secured it. We know how to secure these things. The whole world is moving online. So we have the security technologies. Right. And we have to make this happen to, to get past this pandemic. Now, you and I have talked a lot about remote work and flexibility over the last year. I know that Okta is taking a more flexible approach, but as people start to return to the office, are you starting to see the benefits of that yet? And is it impacting you know, where you want the future to be for your company as, as so many companies are trying to figure out what to do? Yeah, it is a dynamic and really uncharted territory. We figured out how to work remotely like the whole world did. Now we're figuring out how to combine the best of both worlds, the in-person experience, the collaboration and the richness that provides with the benefits and the flexibility of being remote. So our 
underlying principle here is choice. We want to make sure that we trust our employees to do what's right for them. We trust them to know what it takes to be effective in their job, what, what it takes to be effective with their team and make the right choice, whether it's working from home, whether that's coming to the office partially, doing a, a staggered schedule. So the first thing is about choice. And then on top of that, you have to ensure safety. So this is where we really are confronted with this challenge of knowing who's vaccinated and who's not. So we would benefit from this kind of standardization of, of, of a way to, to, the way to verify this. So what we've done is we've said, hey, to be in the office, you have to be vaccinated. We went with the honor system about uh, attesting to that yourself. Uh, and that gives the choice of people that aren't vaccinated to stay home and work from home. And the people that are and want to benefit from that in-person environment, they can take advantage as well. Now, last month, Okta completed its biggest acquisition ever, buying off zero, six and a half billion dollars. We've been having this big sort of high level com conversation about big tech antitrust, but mostly from a consumer perspective. And I wonder if you have thoughts on it from an enterprise perspective. For example, you, com you compete with Microsoft to a lesser extent with Google. Should Microsoft be part of these big tech antitrust conversations? And what should be happening in the enterprise software debate where the leaders have often gotten a pass because there are so many competitors? There's definitely a battle going on in, in our industry. It's a battle for neutrality and choice and independence or a battle to be locked into some of these other big platforms that you mentioned. We believe that it's very critical that the, your identity stack, your identity platform needs to be independent of any other platform. It shouldn't come as part of your email. It shouldn't come as part of your collaboration software. It shouldn't come as part of your infrastructure software. It should give you choice because ultimately Identity is securely connecting you to all of the other technologies. So by having your identity system be independent and neutral, it gives you that flexible linchpin to jump off into any other technology you need to make your business successful. So we feel very strongly about this. And it's why you see us in our products and how we build the company, build this choice and flexibility in from the very core. Okay. All right, well, uh, we'll have to continue that conversation another time. Todd McKinnon, co-founder and CEO of Okta, always good to have you here on the show. Thanks for stopping by. Coming up, more than six months since its initial release, the sci-fi adventure game Cyberpunk 2077 has finally launched on the PlayStation Store with a disclaimer. We're gonna have all the details next. This is Bloomberg. The video game Cyberpunk has returned to the PlayStation Store more than six months after it was removed. The game, featuring the voice and likeness of, of course, Keanu Reeves, debuted last December, but Sony pulled it soon after, after the game suffered multiple bugs and performance issues. It's now back on the shelves, but with a warning that PS4 players may need updates in the near future. Coming up, Amazon's annual Prime Day has kicked off in earnest, but the deals may leave some consumers disappointed. We're going to talk about it all next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Now for a look on the big market activity. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, what have you been watching? Well, I'm actually watching Amazon, but not because of Prime Day. A regulatory filing out on Monday confirming a Bloomberg scoop that Amazon is looking at a stake in Cupertino startup Plus, which does self-driving trucks. Bring up some of the details. Really interesting. They are going to order a thousand of the autonomous driving systems, which are designed for semi trucks. But they're also going to take a stake of as much as 20%. Basically, they're going to buy warrants at a price of around 47 cents per share, giving them, based on the shares outstanding, the right to buy around 20% of the company. Plus, is one of these pending SPAC deals. They did a deal with Hennessy Capital back in January to go public via a reverse merger through the SPAC route. Amazon is getting a little side deal in the process. Remember, Amazon bought Zooks the San Francisco-based self-driving company in 2020. It's also invested in Rivian, of course, which is a battery electric pickup truck maker. So I just wanted to point out some really interesting moves. The shares, though, not really doing anything based on this news or Amazon Prime Day, for that matter, a little lower on Monday. And year-to-date, kind of underperforming, kind of trailing the S&P 500. You wonder, 
going ahead, put e-commerce to one side, what's the big story for Amazon? Is it e-commerce? Is it cloud? Is it the ways they've diversified their business? It's a question I'm going to be asking. Emily. All right, Ed, thanks so much for getting us that update on Amazon. Meantime, though, back to Prime Day. Shopping, of course, uh, one of the biggest shopping days of the year for Amazon underway right now. This year, customers might not be seeing, though, the deals that they may have hoped for. This according to merchants. Due to rising shipping costs, higher advertising rates, and scarce inventory, merchants are also saying that there are a lot of supply chain issues continuing. For more, I want to bring in Melissa Burdick, co-founder and president at PackView. So, Melissa, every Prime Day, I take some time to look at the deals, and normally I don't buy anything. But full disclosure, I did buy some lunch boxes today as I was preparing to talk to you about Prime Day um, for my kids. What was your take? Are the deals good or uh, worth skipping this year? You know, I heard the same thing that you did, but you know, in terms of rising costs and the fact that there's all these kind of supply chain issues that would you know, squeeze profit margins and sellers wouldn't be able to have as great deals. But honestly, looking at the deals on Amazon, they're pretty good. And, you know, when I think about Prime Day, I think about, you know, 23andMe, Instant Pot and headphones. They always have deals, but there are also some new players on the market. So if you look at 23andMe, that's one of the biggest uh, deals that they have. There's a lot of copycats and there's others that are kind of paying their way to the top to, to get into those top slots to win. So there's, there's more options for sure. So just, you know, talk to us a little bit about the evolution of Prime Day because, you know, you worked at Amazon for many years. You know, Prime Day has, has definitely had uh, some bumps in the road. Um, you know, but what has it taken to get to this point and to coordinate all of these deals on such a massive level? Yeah, I mean, Prime Day is several years old at this point, and they kind of have their playbook down. The net of it is it's a big sales event. They haven't innovated too much on personalization or curation. They really seem to rely on the ecosystem. So they have now kind of the evolution is influencers, which is a large part of Prime Day. It's a win-win for them because they actually take a revenue share by driving traffic and demand to Amazon. So a lot of the influencers are curating demand about these products. Um, so the net of the evolution is it's more. They have 2 million deals that everyone kind of expects it and they know they need to prepare for Prime Day. The only issue is it's been a moving target. Last year they moved it to October, this year they moved it into June. Uh, so that makes it the bigger challenge for a lot of people, but they really do kind of have the playbook that they do again and again, and it's, it's a deal day. So last year was a $7 billion event for Amazon. This year expectations around $10 billion. You know, where do you think that number is going to fall? Yeah, uh, I think eMarketer predicts it at 11 billion, which is an 18% increase year over year. And, I, you know, I think that it's going to be a huge event. So that, that sounds about right. And how does this set the stage for the second half of the year? You know, we know that Amazon is going to have a tough year over year comp because last year we were all on lockdown, and now we're at a moment where the pandemic uh, is really starting to be slowly in the rearview mirror, and you have Andy Jassy taking over the company from Jeff Bezos in just a couple of weeks, and so the responsibility for the second half is going to be on him. Yeah, I, I really do think that they're going to have some kind of tentpole event in October again. I don't know if they can call it Prime Day V2 or what they're going to call it, but these problems with supply chain and increasing costs are just going to continue and really condense into that, you know, consolidated five-day time frame during Cyber 5. And so, you know, I really do see Amazon wanting to pull the band forward into October to smooth that out. And I think the big question is, what do they call it? So what do you, what do you, why are these supply chain issues continuing? I mean, you would think that, you know, now sort of a year and a half into this, that they, they would have been shaken out. But what are the real problems that are continuing to persist that the folks on the other end of the, you know, Amazon smile box don't necessarily see? Yeah, I mean, just the, all these issues that start with manufacturing in China with container ship shortage, uh, increasing cost there. There is a toy manufacturer that talked about container. A container cost them seven hundred to twelve hundred dollars, and now the cost is one thousand to sixteen thousand dollars for that same container. Mm -hmm. So I think that we just see a lot. Of, we just see continued kinks in the supply chain 
uh, system. And it's just not something that, you know, one year can fix. It's, it's going to be an ongoing issue for a while. So basically, you're predict we're predicting a prime day too, sometime in the second half of the year, maybe in October, and that that could be could this become a biannual event? I think so. I think the big question is what what's what do they call it? But yes. All right, all right. Well, we'll be looking out for that, uh, Melissa Burdick. Always good to have you here on the show, Packview co-founder and president. Thanks so much for stopping by. Um, we'll continue to watch how those deals play out. For the rest of this Prime Day. All right, coming up, at least 80% of employees who work from home during the pandemic want some aspect of remote work as offices open back up. We're going to talk about whether that's feasible as many companies call for workers to return to the office in person with Shadal Neely, who has studied the intersection of work and technology for more than two decades, professor at Harvard Business School. She's with us next. This is Bloomberg. U.S. tech companies are continuing to outline different versions of their return to office plans. And as some of those policies become reality, it's important to note the motivations and data behind these plans. My next guest says that more than 80% of employees say they want to retain some aspects of remote work. And of that number, 30% want to do it full time. On the other hand, employers, some 70% want people back in the office. For more on these tensions continuing to divide workforces, what's at stake is Shadal Neely, author of the book Remote Work Revolution, Succeeding from Anywhere. She's also Harvard Business School Naylor Fitzhugh Professor of Business Administration. Um, Professor Neely, thank you so much for joining us. This is a raging debate at every dinner table across America right now, and you have spent more than two decades studying remote work. Um, what is the data telling you about the biggest tensions and how these will or can ever be resolved? The data is they're staggering and they're very clear. People want work-life flexibility. That's the term, work-life flexibility. They want autonomy and they've earned the right to ask for this because in the last 15 months or so, they've evidenced that they can be very productive while working from home without managerial oversight. So now employers, on the other hand, want people back and people are asking, why? I don't want the commute. I don't want the expenses to get to work, to eat at work, to have coffee at work. I don't want the work, non-work life friction. I want to have dinner with my family every night. Why do you want me there? For what reason? And yet there are companies that are saying, you know, you have to come back. Are those companies going to be on the wrong side of history? Are they going to lose talent? I mean, there are certainly legitimate reasons to want people to be in the same place. But as you say, uh, you know, there are so many workers that have a different idea in mind. Yes, there's no doubt that many companies, uh, particularly in the finance sector, are wanting people back in the office and in person. And we're talking about Goldman Sachs uh, and uh, um, uh, JP Morgan, Chase and Morgan Stanley, et cetera. But they are unique in this regard. Other companies like PepsiCo, not necessarily in Silicon Valley, and even the US patent office are saying, we will give you flexibility, but let's have a framework that will allow people to do this effectively. Now, the question is, what does that framework look like? And how can we make sure that we retain autonomy and flexibility? You saw that Apple announced their return to work policy, which was an every other day policy and experienced backlash on the same day that uh, they announced uh, their uh, back to work 
uh, policy or framework. So it's really important to be very clear. Why do you want people back? Is it for collaboration? Is it for innovation? Is it for socializing? Because if you ask people to come back in the office to do the exact same thing that they could be doing at home, they're saying, no, thank you. They've discovered They've discovered that work-life flexibility can exist. Work-life balance was an aspiration that could, they could never achieve. But now there's a new approach and there is no turning back. This is about looking forward and those right. who are trying to go backward will be surprised. It was really interesting to see Tim Cook present that plan and hear workers still unhappy with it. I wonder for the companies like Goldman that are on you know, the one extreme of the spectrum, do you think they lose workers? I mean, what happens if a company takes that extreme of a position? If we look at uh, the emerging data to inform us, what we would see is people have been asked, if we paid you $30,000 more per year to come into the office five days a week, would you do that? 67% said, no, thank you. There are also other studies that have indicated that 50% of employees who won't have the flexibility that they so desire in their prof professional arrangements will also quit. We are about to enter, according to Ernst & Young, one of the most competitive talent labor marketplace that we've ever seen in our career. So I am 100% convinced that this flexibility that people are asking for is going to be a, a, a hiring and retention mechanism. And those who are saying no to this will be at a disadvantage in the war for talent. I know we've been doing this for the last year and a half, but it's still hard to sort of imagine what this looks like in normal time. So take me ahead, you know, three years, five years. Does does the sort of workplace dynamic is it is it completely different than what we've what we've known for the last uh, several decades? And what does it look like? Emily, that's one of my favorite things to do, to like imagine, right, the next three years or more. I think hybrid 2.0 is going to introduce physical spaces that are different than the ones that we're familiar with, meaning that work will be a place for socializing and collaboration and also comfortable, the same comforts that we're seeing uh, in our homes. Hybrid 3.0, I'm firmly convinced, is going to be a period where we're going to see the digital revolution play out in our workplaces. It's the nature of work that's changing. This is the thing that the companies that are demanding people to come back are not embracing. The nature of work is changing. So hybrid 3.0 is not about collaborating with Sal and Sally. It's going to be collaborating and working with AI bot. So if we get this right now, we're actually preparing for the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence, data-driven work experiences, and of course, automation as well. This is what I see three years from now, five years from now. That is fascinating. Thanks for imagining with us and painting <laughs> that picture. Of course, a hot topic we are going to continue to talk about. Shadal Neely, professor at Harvard Business School and author of Remote Work Revolution Succeeding from Anywhere. Appreciate you sharing your perspective with us, Professor. Okay, coming up, the US has the potential to get crypto wrong. That assertion and more from our recent interview with Coinbase co-founder and Paradigm Managing Partner, Fred Ursum. We'll hear more from him and get you the view on the crackdown on crypto from China next. If you're an avid crypto watcher, you're paying attention to early crypto adopter and Coinbase co-founder Fred Ursa. He believes that the blockchain will be the most world-changing technology of the coming decades. On the latest edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, he talked about regulation and why the U.S. could get crypto wrong. Take a listen. So I think the U.S. is at a very important crossroads with crypto today. Um, 
The U.S. is blessed with the best currency and the world's reserve currency today. Um, it also tends to be the de facto financial regulator for a whole bunch of the world. We also have a history of uh, being the strongest technology country in the world. If you look at the most valuable companies in the world today, most of them are American internet technology companies, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Facebooks. I do think uh, that crypto is a nuanced issue um, and that it's possible the US gets crypto wrong. Um, I think today you have a lot of regulators whose job it is to mitigate risk and keep us all safe. And that's, that's very appropriate. Um, at the same time, I think crypto is the next internet sized opportunity for the United States. I think it has the, the potential to create as many if not more jobs in the internet, similar with economic growth. Um, I think it has the potential to square the circle on the privacy internet issues that we've been talking about with big tech companies for the last 10 years. Namely, we could use these technologies um, to continue to own our own data while still getting all the benefits of the internet platforms we know and love today. China is taking a stand on crypto for better or for worse, and that's also where most of the mining is happening. Do you have concerns that China is going to beat the US in crypto and that that's kind of a big deal? Candidly, yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, and it's on multiple fronts to your point. One is um, there are government programs to explicitly build using crypto. This is true both with their DCEP initiative, which is basically ma making a digital renminbi. It's also true of local governments who are trying to use blockchain technology. Um, and then to your point, historically, most crypto mining has been in China. Recently, there was actually a government crackdown in China um, on mining, oftentimes because energy was being siphoned from the Chinese grid in ways that may or may not have been kosher. Um, so I think there's actually a huge moment of opportunity today uh, for miners in the United States or globally to, uh, to step in and on the crypto side to make it more decentralized. Um, and then if you want to view it from a nation state point of view to, to make sure that no single country is, is in control. Coinbase and Paradigm co-founder Fred Ursum there, part of a much longer conversation. You can catch at Bloomberg.com. You can also download the Studio 1.0 podcast and watch, listen while you ride. As for the messaging around crypto coming out of China, though, given the latest crackdown, I want to turn to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joining us now from Beijing. So, Tom, there's a lot going on there, and I'm wondering if you could give us the big picture in terms of what's happening, where it's happening, because some of this crackdown is happening regionally, not necessarily nationally. Mm. But what are the high points that we need to know today? OK, well, it really feels, Emily, like the regulators here have taken their gloves off when it comes to battling the crypto space, particularly in the miners and trading. We'll take you back one month when the state council, so essentially China's cabinet, got together and they put out a message and a statement saying they wanted to see a crackdown on mining and trading. And now you only look at, need to look at these provinces where a lot of the miners have relocated in recent years because of that abundance of cheap energy. So provinces like Sichuan, but also areas like Inner Mongolia, areas like Xinjiang as well. Those are areas where there's been a big growth in mining. And as your previous guest was saying, China up until at least six months ago was home to arguably the majority of mining of cryptocurrencies globally. In fact, the University of Cambridge said around 65% of global mining uh, was all based in China. What we've seen, though, in the last few days is a ramp up in terms of that crackdown. So pulling in the banks and telling them to stop transactions. And then the province of Sichuan as well, officials there saying they're going to close down mines in that province within the next year. OK, so what does this mean then for miners and for investors mm. overall? People are trying to make sense of what China is doing right now and what that means for them. Okay, so there's a couple of key reasons why officials are doing what they're doing. 
One is financial stability and control. They're very worried constantly, uh, the regulators here and officials here, that investors are going to get burnt and that's going to lead to social unrest. That's a concern for them. But also there is that energy use problem as well because China set itself this target of 2060 to be carbon neutral. And when you have Bitcoin mines and other crypto mines, whether that's in Yunnan or Sichuan or India, Mongolia, siphoning off some of this energy, it doesn't really align and dovetail uh, with that longer term goal uh, of China to be carbon neutral by 2060. But I remember just going back in 2017, going and visiting a mine in Inner Mongolia. At that point, it was welcomed by officials because they generated tax revenue, they provided jobs, and it was seen as a growth area. That dynamic has very much changed, and you're seeing some of the big miners like Bitmain increasingly investing in the U.S. Okay. So, look, we've only got about a minute left, Tom, and I'm curious, you know, there's this question mm. of whether China will surpass the U.S. in terms of crypto power or sort of the center of gravity. Is that not the right question to be asking? Well, it's hard to see how that's going to be the case now. But six months ago, that would have been the right, que the right question to be asking. But given the crackdown, the extent of the crackdown we've seen, not just on mining, but on trading, the fact that if you go online here and type in crypto exchange, it is censored. That all points to a direction of travel for officials here where they want to essentially eliminate the crypto space here when it comes to trading, mining and these exchanges. What the focus is on, of course, is the PBOC's own efforts to develop its own digital currency. And we've seen that rolled out and tested uh, in places like the south of China, like Guangdong and Shenzhen, with some mixed results. And they've said of, consistently this isn't about undermining the US dollar, but we know that the US is watching this very closely. Obviously, all of this happening in real time. Tom McKenzie mm. with us on a very early morning in Beijing. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure to tune in tomorrow. We're going to be joined by FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.